And uh, we are so blessed today to have Kim McManus with us on a podcast. I'm so excited. Me too. We finally get to like meet over podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a thing? Really? Yes. So my son-in-law invited me to the Mosaic Conference and flew out to California. And uh, I listened to your husband on his different media stuff. Just amazing, right? And I'm sitting with my son-in-law and there's this lady up there with Irwin and I, she's speaking and she's motivating and I'm going, who the heck is that? And he looks at me like I'm crazy and says, that's his wife. And I'm going, oh my God. <laughs> then, hang on, I'm kind of excited. Then <laughs> about missions. And truthfully, mine and Michelle's heart is, is missions. If we could have a billion dollars, that's all we would do. We would travel the world doing missions. Mm. You really, truly just were, were pouring into all of us. And how many people were at the Mosaic Conference? I, hundreds. I, like, I, I don't know, 800, 900. There wow. was a lot of us. And everyone was just silent listening. Mm -hmm. And I find that your husband, what he does is he takes me out of my comfortable church box. Mm -hmm. And then way out in the outer space somewhere. <laughs> and about the time that he's getting ready to lose me, um, he brings me back into my box and my box is bigger. Mm. I find with you is you take me out of my box and you make me bigger. Mm. And, that, and I, and I told my son-in-law, I said, I got to figure out how to get her on the podcast because we, you know, it's national adoption month and we want to stress that. And we want people to know um, how important our kids, our futures are. And then some kids have been put in rougher situations than others. And I just, it was, it was a burning inside of me. And I said, Peter, I got to figure out how to get her on. So I sneak over to your husband who's on the side, uh -huh. give him my card. And I'm kind of a fangirl of your husband, just to be <laughs> frankly honest. Kind of. <laughs> and I give him the card and I, and I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy that just wants to get to know the speakers on the stage. The, the, it just isn't me. It's really hard for me to approach people um, that are, especially when other people want to approach them. And I slide over my card and I say, I, I need you to give this to Kim. And he looks at me. <laughs> so I think most people are like, I need to put you on my podcast. Right, right. I said, you need to get your wife on. And then I tried to run back to my seat and he goes, calls me back over and introduces himself. And he was so kind and so gracious. And <laughs> well, here we are. <laughs> Here we are. And he is a kind and gracious person. And I love him. I love Erwin McManus. I'm a fan. I'm yes. so thankful. 38 for that. years of marriage. And I'm wow. Like wow. That's amazing. We know your story, um, how you and Erwin met. We yeah. think it's precious. It is. It is. <laughs> like, we're total fangirls over you guys, your relationship, your marriage, and what you do in this world. And we really wanted to have you on this podcast because of that. And because you have an amazing story. And I've heard you speak quite a few times. And I've gone to your the girls' webinar and it's mm -hmm. a, you and Mariah. And you know, when when we had heard that you grew up in the foster care system we were, we were blown away. We were just like, okay, we must highlight Kim McManus because <laughs> the, the, not just because of that, but because of what you've done with that, because there's so many folks that have grown and grown up in the foster care system and really just feel like they're not wanted. They're not, they're not worthy. There is nowhere to go from there. Yeah. And when, when Clay came home and said, guess what? I got Kim is on the podcast. <laughs> First of all, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry. Um, then second of all, I was like, National Adoption Month. We've got we've got to highlight her story. We've got to highlight what she's doing with that and just how gracious God is and how he takes ashes and just makes them so beautiful. So if you wouldn't mind just sharing a piece of your story, you have to go to every <laughs> No, no, I would love it. I what an what an honor, like just to be able to be meet you. Thank you for the, the words that, you know, there's words have weight mm. and true words last. Yeah. You know, and I think in my life, I've learned 
um, in the search for truth, what words are true and what words are not, you know? And um, I was told when I was little <laughs> um, a story and I had to believe it because I was living it. Mm. Like my mother, she was beaten constantly. And mm. as a result, she piled us all, and I was five years old at that time, she piled us all into a car. There were six children mm. at that time. And we drove two hours up to Asheville, North Carolina. And there we unpacked ourselves. And we became a family with one parent. Mm. And that one parent was just a broken uh, and did not know how to survive with all of us. And uh, what was supposed to be family became very broken. Mm. And that story became very, um, in my heart, it became very uh, uh, muddy, you know, who, who am I? Who do I belong to? Mm-hmm. Who will love me, you know? And so um, my mom immediately exchanged my father who was an abuser to who, with someone else that was worse. Mm-hmm. And that's never a child is never supposed to see love through that through those eyes. And I remember the first time I tried to get him off of her and he was trying to beat her that um, I was just five. Mm-hmm. And by the time I became uh, when I when I was seven and that's when social services got involved. And now my mom has nine children. Wow. Nine children, a set of twins. And uh, and so the social services came for me and my sister, Renee, and I was number six child. My, my sister was number uh, five and we would be the ones taken. Mm. And, uh, and it was such a, it, it, you know, it was such a painful thing because the big story leading up to that was when my mother abandoned all of us in a mm. home, no electricity, no food. And, you know, it, maybe it wasn't, I always thought maybe it was everybody's story, but it was my story. Uh. And I, in that darkness and in that place of hunger, there were some things that were deposited in me and, and I carried those with me. I couldn't help it. I just carried them with me. And there was a time when my mother drove away and that was a decision she made. And a child always protects their mom, always Mm -hmm. protects, you know, never wants to think a thing wrong about uh, against their mother or father but there was a day I was an adult I I had to decide I'm going to lose um I'm going to lose my future if I do not recognize a few things and the Mm -hmm. truth that came out of my mouth was alcohol (laughs) was a was a better lover than 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 my parents that loved alcohol more than they could love me Mm. I did never understood that, but it set me free a little bit to rec- to acknowledge that that was a major player. Mm-hmm. It was a major player to say, um, poverty. <laughs> uh, I, I it was out of my control. That was that was what I was given. Mm. Would be would this be my future? I had some I had some very hard decisions to make, and uh, and some of them set me free, and some of them um, I struggled with for all my life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'll tell you, um, I sit here today, completely whole mm-hmm. and free. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the decisions that I had to make as a foster child is I had to say, will I be strong enough not to allow another man to hit me? Mm-hmm. And I've always been true to that. Mm-hmm. Will, um, I, will I be strong enough to do the hard things. And the hard thing was the fact that no one in my family thought education was worth it, Mm -hmm. but no one, everyone quit. Mm. (laughs) And I said, I don't want to quit. I don't want to quit. That's not going to be my future. Mm -hmm. So school was not optional. Education Mm -hmm. was not optional. And I would learn those things that would take me out of poverty. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yeah. Uh, I, I decided that I was not going to, um, uh, I was not going to allow, uh, 
I want I want to be really careful. I, I wasn't going to be like all of the other women in my family, mm. generation after generation after generation. And this whole issue of generational poverty and generational ignorance is, an, is a real issue because um, what it did is it said, um, if you what if you if you quit school, then what are your options? My option, the options in the women in my family were always choose a man that was the least deserving and then start having children without mm -hmm. a commitment. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I don't want that for my life. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. Do you know it, it changed the trajectory of my life to say, I don't want to have children without the commitment of a marriage it was revolutionary. And so some of what I was given was uh, a recipe for disaster and mm -hmm. what God redeemed was wholeness mm -hmm. and a I've lived a life of love mm -hmm. and strength and um, I so want to give that to other boys and girls who mm -hmm. so long for that that's right that's right you know we've had over 40 uh, children in our home foster through by FD and uh, you, you you, what you hope is, is that you mold them into the best that you can before you give them back. Because mm -hmm. many, many of them pass through, you know, five of them stayed. Um, we have five amazing kids um, that are ours. They're Shroffs now. Um, but to hear your story, it's, it's, it's important that we realize that that just, just doesn't go away. The things that were poured into you need to be something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you know i what i hear during this time is that uh yeah we really need to make sure we as parents mm -hmm. of these children need to make sure that we're we're building we need to replace what was broken yeah. so yeah. Well, and, and, and uh, you, the, the idea um that these children and you that you lived adult problems. I mean, you lived things that mm -hmm. were not intended for a seven-year-old mm -hmm. to, to process, to even have to come to those conclusions on your own. You know, when I, with our children, you know, we, we got some at varying ages. Some of our kids were infants, some were seven, some were, and, you know, when we look at our children now, one of them is a teenager and, you know, we have conversations and, and there are things there, there are those aha moments for them where they just go, oh, you know, you actually keep showing up for me. Whereas mm -hmm. that's not something that I was used to or that I had to become accustomed to, or, you know, just simple, simple things that, you know, we take for granted, I believe, um, you know, as children that, oh yeah, your parents just come to all your plays and your kid, your parents just are there. And, you know, when you look at these children and they're just so full of, um, they're so full of love, but sometimes there's an unlocking that has to happen, you know, and when we encourage people to foster and adopt kids, we, we try so hard not to just go, Hey, just love them. And everything's going to be great. And they're just going to be perfect. And they're going to be president. And, but the reality is it's a lot of work. It is. And most of the work is within us. It's how we receive love and what it looks like to commit to someone forever whether they turn their back on you when they grow up, whether they, it's really and truly something that Clay and I have had to discover that this isn't about us. This isn't about us, but we need to be, to know that we're growing through this and that we're able to usher these children into a life, hopefully that is plentiful and set them up for better. And they're the ones that have to make the choice, but we want we, we create the stage, you know, when you think of uh, someone going out on stage and performing, it's like, you want to make sure all the props are there. You want to make sure the lights are good. You want to make sure the mics are working. And, and I just feel like when you become a foster adoptive parent, that that's all you can do. You know, you love them. Yes. But you, you prepare them. You say, Hey, you know, those ugly words that were said to you lies, just what you were saying. Truth is what matters. And what does God say about you? God says you're wanted, you're valued, you're special. 
you know, and, and, and that's the overcomer in this, at least for, for our story too, and with our children. And I'm just, and I'm blown away that you opened with that. You know what, this is about truth. Mm -hmm. This, you know, lies that are told to, to children are just, oh my goodness, you know, you're not worth it. You're a burden. You're this, you're that. And when you really just go, hold on, we need, we need to speak truth into these children. We really and truly also need to know truth ourselves. So, you know, moving forward, you know, we know that you've stepped into this, you know, realm in Malawi and, and I'm blown away with what you're doing over there. Would you, would you share just in, in, it's been seven years, so, seven years, and it's like an atomic bomb over there from what I hear. Well, you know, it, it's like, it's like the work that you're doing with adopted and foster parents. It's like, um, it's so, the need is so great. The, the landscape is so great. And Malawi, just one of the 10 poorest countries in the world, mm. landlocked, everybody goes in there, all the big NGOs go in there mm. and, and the, the, the minister of religious affairs, um, spoke with us, my husband and I, and said, they all go in. They all go in. The UN and the world and world, all of the biggie, the, the nonprofits go in. And they look at these villages and they do, they spend a lot of money on feasibility studies. Mm -hmm. And they go in and they assess all of the dynamics in these villages. And he said, you go in there today and those villages are exactly the same after they did the feasibility studies and decided not to, to work there. Mm. So then we didn't know that. <laughs> Gratefully, we didn't know that. We, we, we went in and said, what would it be like if we actually learned how to um, be good partners for the long game um, and, and really learned Malawans learning our culture, we learning their culture and, and listen really listen and and see them and accept them and and see what they what they want and what they need so eventually we went into the chief chief chaliza and we asked him is there one area that we could focus on that would be most helpful to you in your community and he said and the room was filled with leaders and he said we desperately desperately need education Mm. education in every way, like among the girls and the, and the, and the guys and, and, and then elementary and then secondary. And then, and is, can you um, please focus on that? And, and that it was, it was right up our gifting alley. Mm -hmm. You know, I have an education background. A lot of the people that I brought had already, you know, education backgrounds, it was just a great mix. And we assured him that that's exactly what we would focus on. And then he gets up and he leaves the room and, he, and then, they, then they have a, a group meeting and then he comes back and he's formed a, a village committee. Now, I didn't know that existed in the village, in the bush, but that there, there you go. And he said, I will give you these people and they will work with you. And that's the group of people for seven years we've worked with. Wow. And not to know them. And they said, and whatever you need. And we said, I said, I, we need two things. We need one, we need trust. And the trust would say, what I say to you, I will do. And what you say to me that you will do. Mm. We would build trust. And the second thing is that we would be generous um, and that it would be a shared generosity that you bring what you have and that we bring what we have. You know, Christians believe that they take Jesus to remote parts of the world. They don't believe that Jesus has already been there working and that we get to participate with him in the work that he's already been doing. And what a good God that he would have Malawans teach us how to be good believers, how to be good at relationships, because you know, there's no substitute for genuine uh, human relationships. And uh, people just want to be known and they want to be seen and they want to be heard. And one of the things that they would tell us is, uh, uh, are we doing this right? <laughs> How the heck do I know? I don't even know what I'm doing. You know, but then they would say like, 
they didn't even, the, the leaders didn't even know how to have a lunch together in a restaurant when we would take them into the city or they didn't know, you know. So we step by step, meeting by meeting, we realized we have to bring, we have to know the right people to have sustainability. This was going to be a very long journey and they did not need to see white people coming with money. Big mistake, white right. people with money. And so then um, we connected with African Bible College and Live Love Malawi. Mm. And our best friend became a man by the name of Blessings, Chimpombo. And then we just started learning from him. And then that relationship grew. We, we have lots and lots of uh, coaches that go in and translators that go in. And they're there every week. And so then we said, um, this can't just be about learning. We have to have some, some ground has got to move. And uh, the school that they, they were, they had was just children on a concrete slab. And a lot of the kids were learning out under trees outside. The teaching staff was very minimal. And the students were, oh, with 200 students in a class. And, and their classrooms were just dilapidated, no resources. No one has books, no books. And so we went in and, and, uh, and, and, and God just provided them the resources. Um, we, during, this happened during the pandemic where we, saw, we decided we can be there, but can we be there? And can it look like Malawans have built a school? And so we started the construction of a school, which was 12 classrooms, um, a sick bay for, for students who are struggling with malaria or for food insufficiency or whatever they're struggling with to know that we're going to have a nurse on campus mm. and administration block and a huge kitchen to say that, you know, hungry students can't learn. That's right. And so one by one, piece by piece, things started to be built to be built. And now we have a full, full school. Wow. The old school is gone. The new school is there. The new leaders are in place. There's books on the campus. There is a feeding program that's going to start in a week. And, um, and so our, our posture is that we all rise together, including us. We all learn together. God wants to do something powerful. Why not it be the model for other things? Right. And um, so when we went in to meet the president of the country, it was because we were not like the other nonprofits that said, um, let's do another feas feasibility study and then do nothing. Mm. Uh, this would be the church. And the church's model would say, look, I'm not trying to make a church that I want, mm -hmm. but that we're, we're building the world we want through the church. That's right. You know? And so the church has a beautiful presence in Malawi, but mm. also the church in Malawi is a beautiful presence. Mm. So as we move forward, note, there's one school, how many other schools can take from this model and, and, and rise out mm. of the bush, out of that, to say, like, as a foster kid, nobody believes in foster kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nobody That's really true. believes that foster kids can be successful. And we're just statistics. But to also the kids in the bush, they don't believe that kids in the bush can be successful. Mm -hmm. When I met a woman who came out of the bush, I'm like, if you could do it, surely mm -hmm. we can help other girls come out, other mm -hmm. boys come out. Mm -hmm. And so this beautiful education model is, is developing and I'm, I'm, I'm learning. And now we're on phase four building uh, teacher housing. Wow. Now, how many kids are attending the school right now? About eight, 900. Wow. And so get that eight, 900, eight, nine, eight to 900. Right. Mm -hmm. So are, wow. are being impacted because one church decided to go across the world and build a, a school. And that school, from what I understand, is state of the art. You do you. It's state of the art. It's better than the schools we have here, from what I understand. <laughs> They're beautiful. We ourselves to go just so we can <laughs> physically see this place. So but we can I testify. Wanna, it, it also, <laughs> but I don't want to miss the point that 
you didn't go and tell them what they needed. You went and asked them what they needed. Mm -hmm. And then you fulfilled their needs from their lips to your ears. Mm -hmm. And I think so many times the church miss, misses that. I yeah. think we as people miss that. We want to give people what we think they need instead yeah. of what they need. They actually need. <clears throat> yeah. Well, isn't it in Jeremiah where it talks about, you know, going out and improving the city to make, you know, even, even good Muslim, even good, you know, um, Buddhists, even so that they can see the goodness of God. Sometimes it's not just this, Hey, I'm just going to go smack the gospel on everybody. And it's mm -hmm. really, really saying, you know what? We love you. And that's what God did. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus, he loved people. And I think that's the mission that we miss. <laughs> it's the, Hey, we've got the money. Like you said, rich white people, we come in we have the money and we will and deal it. And it's well, well let's sit down. Let's listen what do you need? What's the one thing you need? And I love that. That's I, 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 some her. of the things that have come out of this is the leaders rising up to fight for themselves. Yeah. Yes. And so then when we see them fight for their school, when I say, who does this school belong to? Because mm. I don't, we don't, we, there's a, it's not mosaic primary right. school. It's Chaliza primary school. It's named after the community. And they say, who does this school belong to? And they say, it's, it's ours. We take ownership. We, it's ours because we built this. Yes. And they say that because we hired the community people to build. Of course, we, we brought in a great contractor and his people guided, but we hired the community so they could see themselves building. We didn't bring a bunch of mission people you know, and to do, you know, bring it in and build it up. You know, they mm -hmm. said, this is our school. And that's what we long to hear because it'll be sustainable when we find solutions that will can in leadership, find solutions in education and in, in instruction, find solutions. And it's to say people can come to the table all together and have great things to offer. And I think they've really learned that we've learned that. That's so good. So That's good. You, you allowed them to take ownership of what you helped do. And I think in our own communities, when we go out into our communities and for a family to take ownership or responsibility, one thing we do is we work with our local sheriff's department, the special victims unit. We go in and try to keep families together instead of having kids removed. We give them resources. But I think it's powerful that we give them ownership over their families. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a perfect example, you know, yeah. clear across the world, how a community took ownership of not only the school, but that that means of the teachers, of the children, of their futures. Um, it empowered. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the word here is family. Mm -hmm. In the developing, in the development world, among grand organizations that have bazillions of dollars, the narrative is invest in the girl and the girl will save the village. And that's just not true. Mm -mm. Mm. It's too much. It's too much because you're leaving the family behind. You're right. leaving the boys behind and you're leaving the family behind. It was always strengthening the whole and the whole is family. It's community. I yeah, we are, we are and, and Malawi is beautiful with community, beautiful. Mm -hmm. They still have that strong. They've never been affected by war. We really want to get in there and say to all of the, you know, people who go in to, to start businesses in Malawi, they say there's no natural resources. I'm like, are you kidding? The people are their natural resources. Mm -hmm. the children, mm -hmm. you wait, they're flourishing. You wait, you just nurture that alone and watch them hit all of their development, developmental goals. Mm -hmm. And that's been beautiful to see because, you know, I really believe in a God of hope. That's right. That's right. You know, and it's, it, you really hit the nail on the head when you say family is where it's at, you know, because, because of what we do with foster care and adoption, you know, a lot of times we want to look at that as an opportunity to save someone. Mm -hmm. And our whole goal is the family. You know, when you're fostering, you know, our hope is that mom and dad can get back on their feet and can work their plan. And, you know, we really encourage folks that are going to foster here in New Mexico, that they have a relationship with those parents, mm -hmm. that they step into those parents' lives and they encourage those parents to do the right thing. You know, we do a parenting class also that we, we just, we want to bring parents together and go, Hey, you're not alone. 
You know, I, I couldn't parent alone. I mean, we have 10 kids for goodness sakes. I have friends. I have girlfriends. I remember when I first became a mom, I met the woman in line. At, I mean, I didn't know her name. I knew she was Emma's mom, you know? So just think of how, you know, we've connected with people and I'd say, you know, we're a typical normal family, but we all need that. Everyone needs that kind of community where women can get together and talk about the struggles that they have being moms. Oftentimes women are isolated because of that generational, you know, whether it be alcoholism, whether it be poverty, whatever it may be, but there, you, that cycle can be broken. It doesn't just have to be with a child. It can be, it can be with that mother. That mother can break that cycle. That mother can say, not here, no more. It's not happening. And that's what I truly believe for us here in New Mexico, because we're pretty much dead last, anything having to do with families. We're, we actually, are dead last. we're actually 51st, believe it or not. Wow. So we, you know, we see the, the need so strongly in New Mexico and, and it sounds like Malawi is very similar to New Mexico. Mm. We, we have cl- schools that we've been doing parenting classes in that the proficiency is like, what 5% reading and math skills, you know, they're shut down schools and we're going, okay, we can sit and do reading programs with the kids, but we need to pull mom and dad in. We need to sit down. We need to encourage those parents because it is, you can't, I mean, this child is going to be with us for a short time, but they're going home and we want to impact that unit. We want to impact them all and not make mom and dad, the bad guys. Mm. Because it's so easy to do that it's so easy to come off like we're the savior and we're just not, we're not the savior. (laughs) Hey, raising your own kids. So we have bio kids, you know, we had them first. And uh, of course you have two, (laughs) you have two children. It's hard raising kids. (laughs) So hard. (laughs) No, I mean, people always go foster care. I don't know if I could do that. Well, if you could raise biological kids (laughs) kids, you can probably raise foster kids they're kids and there's problems that come with all of them yeah hey just talk as a mom yeah i am motherhood is a learned you know (laughs) learned task it's a learned job and i've had the 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 i've had the gift from god to have kids i have my, our first daughter was not birthed by me. You know, she came to us through, um, we, we were pastoring a church in South Dallas and she, Patty came abandoned by her family. And so I heard God say in my ear, when I picked Patty up for church one day, I took you, mm. you take this one. Mm. And it's like his hand on me was his hand on her. Mm. And I was just supposed to be what my foster parents were to me. And so we took Patty in what would be, was supposed to be two weeks. And she lived with us until the day she got married. Mm. And you know, walked her down the aisle. Mm. Yeah, you know, he gave her away. Then he did the ceremony. And then, you know, and there she was. Patty was our first. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea how to take a teenager and parent. And then our son was born and then our daughter was born. And then we had this mixed family that we, that was us. And we had to learn like motherhood, man, it is just not all, you know, love every day. This stuff is hard work. Say it again. It's right? hard. It, it's so hard. And if you think that it's not gut wrenching, mm. we all understand how, how, you know, we have to, you know, it's just the hardest thing I've ever done. Erwin, my husband, seemed like it was so natural to him. It was so natural to be good dad, you know, but I had to be organized mom. I had to be, you know, mm-hmm. chaos control mom. I had to, I felt like I was so out of my zone because I never had that like, I never had that model, you know, even I, w- I was put into foster care in foster care on a farm. So my foster mom was a farmer. Oh, and wow. My dad was a farmer. So <laughs> it's like, and when you're in LA, you can't be foster mother. That's a farmer. You, right. have be, you have to be like urban mom. 
And yes. so just trying to, 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 to navigate those and then how to be a pastor's wife and then how to be in ministry and then how to, I just realized to so, so far into the game, I realized, okay, this is all of us. We're all on mission. Mm -hmm. It's so not, true. you're not my mission. Nope. We are the mission. We are the hands in the will of God. And we are going to do this. And it, education is not going to look the same like all the other families. And you're not going to be a cheerleader. And it, everything's going to be pretty. And you're not going to be involved in everything because we have this. Mm -hmm. And we are all on mission together, including Patty. That was, she was the greatest mission. Uh, you know, she was the great, she became the pastor. I mean, there's like this girl, when Patty accepted Jesus, she was like on fire. And I realize now why we realize that determination is such a key component to the success of anybody that's in foster care or adoptive care. Determination. We can't give it, we can't put drive in, but boy, when we spot it, we know that's a key to, uh, to getting out of that mindset of poverty is determination. Yeah. And I saw it. So I saw it in Patty and I've seen it in my own kids. And when I, this is the, this is the success of having adult children, especially when you feel like you're not, you know, been a great mom. When your child says to you, um, this is when Aaron moved to New York and he was struggling to get a job there and he called home and my husband said, well, you know, honey, if you need to, you can draw unemployment. And you know how I knew that a, a generational mindset had been broken is when he said, why would I ever draw unemployment when I have the ability to work? Mm -hmm. Wow. Generations of my family had decided yeah. that they were owed a government check every month and they didn't have to work. But here, see how God breaks generational um, strongholds mm -hmm. and that had been broken with me mm -hmm. and so many things like that. And I see that evidence, that's a beautiful thing. I see the evidence of my children, you know, the, the extravagance of seeing them live out their passions. Mm -hmm. If you have a poverty mindset, you don't, you don't get that extravagant. Mm -hmm. You're surviving, surviving. And how, how do you survive? You survive by having some means and then money becomes everything. And I've seen that money isn't everything to us. Mm -mm. Everything is like um, family and everything mm -hmm. is mission and mm -hmm. everything is um, our future. Mm -hmm. and so I, it, it, that wasn't given to me. That is a whole new legacy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the beauty of being a mother in this and having children that have, have been raised. That's right. Well, you know, you brought it up several times that there's a, and I'm going to call it a generational curse in a, and, and that's where things get, uh, yeah, because mom and dad were an alcoholic and because mom and dad were abusive and because mom and dad, and we could go on and on. And we deal every single day with the people that we work with, but the curses are easily broken if we can take them out out of that cycle and show them a better way, not give them, not to, we don't give handouts. We give hands up, right? Uh -huh. We pull out of the places they are. And education is so important, but education could be as simple as how to balance a checkbook, how to mm -hmm. go to that next step, how to get along with the kids at school, how to study at home. It's amazing how little things can break that cycle. We just need to take them out we need to take them out of that and we need to teach the parents. That's why we believe so fervently in teaching the parents, parenting classes mm -hmm. and what kids and you can see it. You can see it in your own life. That mm -hmm. that's a example, how that cycle could have continued, but it didn't, it was broken because of the actions that you took. I've even verb like told my children when I feel like I'm going, cause you and I have, similar backgrounds from what I can hear. And there are things that I have to consciously say, Hey guys, we're not going to do that. I'm right now. I feel like this is something that has been generational for me and we're going to break it. We're not doing that. We're just not doing it. And they're like, what? <laughs> I go, no, no, listen to me. That's, that's not an option. That's just not an option. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm that to my children, because I know that if I verbally say it to them, then I mean it, I've said it. 
I'm not going to break it because I have accountability now Mm -hmm. and letting my kids know that this is not going to, this, this is not okay. It's not okay for you to do this Mm for what you see that before me, it's stopping here. And I just have, and I just, I have to say it out loud at times. I just go, nope, not, not today. We're not doing that. And I, I do, I notice in my kids, even that they're just like, oh, we can't. Yeah. We don't do that. Yeah. That's not us. Like you said, that's not us. That's not us. And just saying that, just saying that that's not us. Mm -hmm. Can you, do you understand that they've never had an us, right? The yeah. sense of family that, that, that you, you, when you say that this is not us, mm-hmm. it has solidified their place inside mm-hmm. with you. You know, I mm-hmm. love that. I love that. You're not, yeah. they're not cast away. They're not outside. Mm-hmm. I think that's what I, you know, by, and, and you, th- th- you're so definitive. You, you're, you're so, you know, you have concrete foundational important things that you believe in. And mm-hmm. that's also a breaking of the family. When, when they, when that family fell apart and that was part of their trauma and they got thrown out into foster care, uh, it, it unmoors you. It, it pulls up everything and you don't have a sense of like attachment. Where do I belong? Where do I, who am I in mm-hmm. this? And unfortunately, so many of these kids, they've lived already a life of that uncertainty. Is mom going to be there today? Is there going to be a paycheck? Is that bill going to be paid? Is there transportation? Is there going to be enough? You know, the whole idea of just being enough and always living in a space of not having enough is so very break. It just breaks your spirit. And I remember being a child of, of the lacking, you know, I just always, we Mm. never had anything. And so Mm. I don't know what I expected from foster care, but just having the food on the table, every meal was mind blowing. Yeah. Having Mm. a bed to sleep in Mm -hmm. and to have clean sheets. Mm -hmm. I I thought who wanted to excel in life? I didn't know about excelling. All I wanted was a normal life. Yeah. Yeah. When, when we started fostering, we, we had made the decision that we weren't going to call our foster kids, foster kids. We were just going to the F word. Yeah. We called it the F word. We don't say the F. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Remember one of our new kids, um, Clay was getting up for work and they'd been here maybe a week. And the little girl says, where's, because she immediately called Clay daddy, where's daddy going? And I said, he's going to work. She said again, Mm. every day, (laughs) every day, baby. (laughs) But it was something so simple that it was so natural to us. And for her, it was so unusual. And she would also ask me, why do you dress the baby every day? (gasps) And I said, well, we, that's what we do. We dress baby every day, you know? So it's just, it's, it's those things that you just have to go, no, 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 this is what we do. Oh, well, why, why do you do that? Well, because we love baby and we want baby to be warm. We want baby to know that, that she's loved and we want to feed her and we want to make sure. And then if she gets dirty, when she eats, we change her clothes. What? Like just prof- just simple things that we take for granted. You know, was, is profound. Yeah. Yeah. Consistency is profound. It is. It and is. constancy, just like you faithfully doing what you do every day uh, says to, it builds into yeah. the human heart, a sense of, of like, I, I can depend, I can trust. You think about everybody breaking trust. Mm. You are the ones that will always be known for building it. Mm. You know, I should- <laughs> Hey, do two things for me. Speak to the, the listeners who may have been foster kids mm. or, or, or maybe even aged out of the system or, Speak to them and then follow it right up with speak to those who are hesitating on becoming foster or adoptive parents or mentor or mentoring. Yes. Yeah. Um, so first to foster youth, um, you absolutely are created by a loving God who had a plan 
that this wasn't it. This wasn't the plan that you suffer. It wasn't the plan or that you were traumatized or you were hurt. It wasn't the plan. But this is a new day with, with new opportunities, with new hope. And, and when I speak to you, it's just from that pain of saying some hard choices you're going to have to make. And some days this is going to be every single day. And every yes, I found myself making every yes forward, doors began to open for me. And, and, and there was hope on the other side of that door. There was a lot of disappointment. And then there was maybe other, other things I had to do. But then I learned resilience. Never quit. Mm. Hope. It's there. It's accessible. Love may not always be given to you. But there's a, a source that, that you can draw from. That you can give love. And giving love often and most of the time has a return to it. And I, I will encourage you that I will never, I mean, I will not promise you that there's going to be, um, that your life will be put back together, that somebody's going to come for you to rescue you. Because I believed, you know, for, all, for a long time that, that somebody was going to knock on my door and say, this was a big mistake mm -hmm. and that I had, I could now live the, with the fantasy that I, I had, I had it when I would go to bed. Because I became a, a kid of the fantasy that this was a mistake and that somebody's going to correct this mistake. Somebody's going to come and get me until I realized I was it. And I had to learn hard work and resilience and toughness. And I had to really get this job done. I had to go to school. I had to say yes to, you know, the work. And God honors that. God will take you from a place of lacking and he will give you the skills you need to build a life and to build a future and so for that you are up for the task don't let anybody condemn you for your past don't let anybody look down on you because you're uh you are you were given as a foster child but look god doesn't see you that way he's like you are mine i say you are to live and i am going to give you everything that you need to do that. And I, I pray the best for you. I pray that God will just create such a pathway that when you walk in it, it, that it's a good path for you and that you are meant for success, that you are meant for wholeness, that you are meant for happiness. And don't let anybody tell you anything different. Don't listen to them. Don't even listen to the words in your head from people in the past that have said that that have thrown you away or that have given you other options, but your only option is to, to hope and just, and, and just believe, believe that God loves you because he does. Um, mm. But the, the parents, <laughs> <laughs> see the parents who would consider being a foster a parent or an adoptive parent, you have everything that you need. You really do. You're stronger than you think. You're, you have gifts that you don't even know as a gift, but they're so natural to you that you just go about your business and you do your thing. And, and then all of the experiences that you've had, all the things that your parents gave you that filled the gap, you can give to somebody else to fill their gap. And, um, and I, I just want you to take the, the leap of faith to say that you, if God tells you to do it, do it, just do it, do it. And then, you know, be determined that you're going to do it well, right? And then, and God will give you the, the, the person and he just brings you together. I know Patty, Patty for us was our Patty. In fact, our daughter would say, where is my Patty? Mm. We just became that kind of family. And we did not know that was coming, but God had that for us. There, there is no substitute for the natural um, loving hand of God who wants to rescue one and you are it. You are the one, the safety place, the safe place for somebody to land and everybody deserves a home. And if you've got one, then there is power in a life that's open and hands that are open and hearts that are open. 
and, and words that speak life into another a human being. So I, I want you to have the courage to do the next great thing, and that is to be um, love and life to someone else. Mm, so That's good. good. So, so now good. you know why she's definitely a voice of a lion. That's right. You are. <laughs> hey, um, we, we always end with, uh, if you could speak to the whole world, and it doesn't matter if they're rich or if they're poor, it doesn't matter who they are. If you could speak to the whole world all at one time, what would your message be? Ah. <laughs> if I could speak to the whole world all at one time, what would my right. message be? I mean, our podcast isn't that big, here. but we're hoping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I want to be a translator of a story that people can understand. Hmm. How, no matter how far outside of love you think you are, or where you have been birthed what you've been birthed into know that god has this beautiful redemption story for you and for me it was it was that i would uh, fall in love with someone who understood what unconditional love was and was committed to me that that wasn't beyond that I would have a home <laughs> and the lights work, the heat works, <laughs> there's beds in that home and there's enough for everyone. Mm. And that home is everything to me. So when you come into my home and you sit down at my table, that I would feed you, that I would care for you and I would love you. And that, that came from a place of, of needing that in my own life once, but now I'm committed to giving it and sharing it. And that's all we're committed. That's all that we are asked to do is, is, just, is just share what we've been given. And I feel so grateful to God that I, that, um, that I had a home and 38 years into being married that I have a, that have a best friend to do life with mm. and that we travel the world and that we, that we um, believe in love <laughs> and that we believe that Jesus is the only way and that he is perfect love. And why would I not want to follow a perfect love like that? Who's always, God said, I, God said to me on my foster bed, <laughs> could I say that because the nights were sleepless and they were long. And growing up took a long time. Mm. God said to me, I will father you. Mm. And I said to God, I will follow you. Mm. And that has never been untrue on his part. He's always fathered me. And I never had a father who would own me, who would mm. say for mine. And God always, he always promised that I would belong to him. That seems like a lot of message to have for a life message. <laughs> That's true. Good. It's good. That's good. <laughs> hey, what's next, next for Kim McManus? Well, I'll tell you, as a result of after so many years of this journey, we started a, uh, we started a, uh, it was really a heart, a heart project. It's called Mosaic Education Initiative. And we are focusing on foster youth. And we we're focusing on youth coming out of being uh, the life of a refugee and also some of our international students and they get scholarships when they're headed to college and oh, they, get, yeah. they get coaches that will surround them and love them and say we'll fill the gap if you don't know how to use an atm we're going to teach you how to use an atm oh, if good. You fill out that application we're there for you and so it's a it's a time where determination can meet opportunity and so that's what we're doing right now, Mosaic Education Initiative with a bunch of kids here because we realized we're, you know. Hey, how do people donate to that? And get involved. Go to mosaicei.org, uh, mosaiceieducationinitiative.org. And, we'll and that it all goes to scholarships. 
It'll be good. Yeah. So we didn't know about this. So that's yeah. Hard. Yeah. Wait, wait. Well, actually, I heard Irwin talking about it. And oh, you listen. I just drive. <laughs> it's only one year old. And I'll tell you, it is exciting to when people are desperate. That education was my way out of a foster care system. It was to say, I oh, right. have a way. And it's to give opportunities for students here in LA yeah. and around the world. Well, in education also, I mean, there's benchmarks, you know, you, you, you get something, you know, you get a degree, you get a diploma, you, you get awards, you, there is something that you do get out of it. That's tangible for someone that has never received anything that is sticky like that. So well, we could go awesome. on for hours with Kim. I know. We're going to have to say <laughs> goodbye. And we are so thankful. Just so my listeners know the, the, you can tell when people bump in, you love pours out and that what a great thing about you. Thank so. you. Thank you. What a kind thing to say. I, 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 I want to be known by love. You know? Yes. Yes. That's, I've been loved well. Yes, you have. <laughs> Thank you okay. for having me on your podcast. Yes, Do not hang you. up. <laughs>